this episode of Skeptico, a show about getting it done the old-fashioned way. What's it all about? America, Jesus, freedom. Say it again. America, Jesus, freedom. And what does that mean? Shit, I don't know. But the people sure love it when I say it. And the newer way. You have 30,000 people that were purged and voted. So after doing a lot of research and identifying suspicious records, I made requests to what we call the canvas team. In one case, this lady told our canvasser, you know, this has my three registrations all on the same two days, one right after the other, a year before I actually registered to vote. And I know this because I was pregnant when I went in there to register and my one-year-old son is in the house right now. Individual voters are totally incapable of doing this. You can't, you have to have access to the official database to do it. That first clip was from my favorite election movie of all time, Campaign with Will Ferrell and Zach Galifianakis. And the second was from today's amazing guest, Andy Paquette. And this dialogue went on and on, so I actually broke it into two because they're really kind of two completely different subjects. But I think you'll enjoy both of them. Remember, don't get too sucked into the drama. It's just a show. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome Andy Paquette back to Skeptico. You know, Andy, I wanted to start with a little story, and uh, I don't know if I've told this. I've told it to you, but I don't know if I've told it on air. But Trish and Rob McGregor, who have you know, kind of well-known in the paranormal, parapsychology, written over 100 books, but he's with George Lucas, you know, kind of thing. They heard an interview that we did, that you did for me, and they said, gosh, we got to have that guy on. So they interviewed Andy, and at the end, exact quote, uh, Trish goes, I think Andy might be the most psychic person I've ever met. Now, I mean, that's pretty amazing, especially when you, uh, if you read her books or listen to all, I mean, she, she always has these stories of these incredible people that she's met. And uh, it's kind of true. What's really, really extraordinary about you, Andy, and I've shared this before, but let me share my screen for a second. So if, if anybody wants to go, and I think you will want to go. P-A-Q-A-R-T dot com. Drawings, paintings, commercial art, Hollywood, you know, doing computer graphics on what was that, what's the biggest movie you ever did? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I worked on Space Jam and Spider-Man and Daredevil and then some smaller ones. So then you have this incredible photography that you do commercially in New York, you know, like major thing. And then along the way, you kind of get a, PhD just because, just because you wanted to, I guess. And then, so we're not going to talk about any of that today because <laughs> what we're going to talk about is Art Zark because it was more than a year ago, you contacted me about this topic that we're going to talk about. And I immediately realized that you had done just what I think a lot of people just find to be impossible. And a lot of people at the end of this might still think is impossible. But at the time I thought, wow, this is so, so big and such a huge story that I, I love that Andy is sharing it with me, but there's no way this is ever going to make it on Skeptico. This is going to be a national news story. He's going to be contacted by all the major news outlets. This is just too big. And if anything, I was kind of worried about your, your safety because it was such a huge story and such a, uh, important story. Of course, here we are a year and a half later on tiny little Skeptico getting out what is really just an amazing, amazing story. And uh, my spin on it, of course, is always going to bring us back to the spiritual in some way, the questions of uh, why evil matters, who are the characters really behind that in terms of that larger spiritual perspective, which you are so much about as well, even though it isn't going to come out directly in what we're going to talk about. So with that, I don't know, I wasn't trying to tease this thing, 
But with that, I guess maybe you should tell us how you wound up with, like the first time I talked to you, I remember you said, I just downloaded the database. I have a database of all the voters in New York, like 8 million voters or something like that. I, I mean, I, wh what is the, what is the starting point that we should start with this whole thing? Okay. First off, I hate to say this, but in your intro, I've been wanting to like kind of stop you and, and say something and, and hopefully not horrify you too much, but I, I wanted to do this as Dr. Zark without connecting it to Andrew Paquette. Uh, is that too is late? That too late. Everybody knows you, Andy. Everybody in skeptical land totally knows you. I mean, you can't, it, and, and you shouldn't. I think again, I thought about that because we talked about that in pre interview. No, the story is that now we, we can talk about this. It's okay to talk about it. You've published on it. You've published on it. You've done public presentations on it. You, you're, you, you've outed yourself. There's no need. We don't have to make a big deal out of it, but yeah. So how it started was I had come to New York to start up a commercial photography studio. Okay. And I'd invested quite a lot of money on that too. It was not cheap to do this. And, uh, I did that right after I got my PhD because, uh, well, in part, what happened was I was working out PhD at King's college, London, and I realized I don't like doing this. This is not any fun. Okay. I, the research in my dreams was fine because I was doing it for my own purposes and I kind of wanted that information. I wanted to understand that information, but the research I was doing for the PhD, I was thinking, okay, as soon as this is done, I'm never doing this yet. This is it. Okay. And at the same time, while I was working on the PhD, just to kind of relax from all the pressure of teaching full-time and doing a PhD and traveling to London, all this time to do it. Um, I had picked up photography and I'd started getting clients and I thought, you know what, this is what I want to do. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to uh, as soon as I have the PhD and I'm going to move back to New York and I'm going to start a commercial photography studio. So that's what I want to do. So I came out here and, um, uh, as I'm sure you understand setting up any kind of a business, it takes you a little while, right? And then you start getting your clients and then you get more clients and then you're going concerned. And I expected that. So i saved up some money and I was able to last quite a while. Um, so I figured it'd take me at least a year before I was even at point of first contact for a client. And then maybe another year and I start having a, a low level of client, but it would, it would get me where I needed to be so that I could have a continuing stream of them. So about 18 months later, I got my first client and then shortly after I got another one and then the pandemic hit. Okay. And then all of a sudden everything was shut down. The studios were shut down. I couldn't access clients. The, the crews I would have to work with in New York were unavailable. And even if they were available, there was nowhere to shoot. It was like everything just stopped. Okay. And I, I was, I was just, I was sitting there and I was thinking this can't be happening. And yet it was. So I thought, okay, fine. I can't do any business. So I'm just going to take pictures of, you know, fun stuff. So I was taking pictures of diners and farms and churches, you know, anything I thought looked really American. Uh, I also wanted to do a series on uh, tractor trailers, which I haven't done yet, uh, uh, trucks and things like that. But anyway, so this is what I'm doing when I see a podcast that was talking about audits across the country. And the thing is that that got my interest. And the reason oh, it got election audits, this is after, yeah. after the 2020 election. And this was just about the hottest topic. You couldn't go anywhere without the whole, and then it's, it evolved into the whole January 6th and the, the whole thing. But if we got to go back now, cause it's the t calendar has flown by. It's easy to forget what a central issue this was gripping everybody. And, and by the way, well, you know, this is at the time Google comes out and says, Hey, the only thing that is verboten we are not allowing is any kind of searches about election fraud or vaccines were the two, two things that, that they just said, which is strange and part of this story, but just to put it in context, it's about the election. Well, yeah, it was. And here's the thing. When I moved to New York, I was thinking, okay, I'm moving to a blue state. So when the election happened, I've got that in my mind. I'm thinking this is a blue state. It's a stable blue state. They don't need to commit fraud. They will win anyway, because they have so many people who vote that way in the state. So I would really was assuming that New York was going to go to all of the Democrat candidates. It didn't strike me as at all unusual when that happened. What struck me unusual though is the night of the election, I was in bed watching the election return on my iPad and I saw Trump had 
more than a half million vote lead in Pennsylvania. And he had about a half million vote lead in Wisconsin. He had these huge leads in the states that were going to determine the election. And there was no way after the polls closed that anyone was going to catch up to that. It just wasn't going to happen. He was going to win. And that's what I was thinking when I went to bed. And I went to bed at like three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. Anyway, but when I woke up, they were all saying Biden was the winner. And I was sitting there thinking, how, how, how on earth do you make up that many votes? That was the thing that was puzzling me uh, so much, especially because they said they closed all the counting centers. It's like, so, so you stopped counting and you woke up the next morning and all of a sudden there's a half million more votes in there and it puts you over the top. And now the guy who was the winner last night is the loser. It didn't make sense to me. So anyway, so I heard about a group that was going to try and audit the election here in New York right around August. And I thought, you know what? I don't have anything else going on. The wife was saying, you got to do it. You got to do it. You just have to know. And I was like, yeah, I do. I didn't have to know. So I, I, I signed up and one of the first things that happened was they asked me to be research director, which surprised me because I, I, I was like, how do you know that I would be qualified to do that? It, it just didn't make any sense for me. And I, I have a feeling my PhD helped a little bit, but I'm sure they had other people with advanced degrees that were on the team too. I, now my current theory is I might've been like the only guy at the moment at that time that had applied because apparently I'm like one of the first people on the team without realizing it. Because that's what always happens when you're second, you think the first guy was there forever, you know what I mean? So, but in fact, the group had just put, uh, put themselves together. So this is the group, New York Citizens Audit that you joined so auspiciously and then, yeah. So, so what happens next with the database? Okay. Well, first thing was, uh, we were supposed to, I, I told them, I said, look, there is nothing to, there's no research to conduct until we have data. We have to have data. So you have to ask for them. So we need to get, um, the, uh, the databases for all the counties. And at the time they had somebody handling the, those kinds of requests, they're called FOIL requests in New York, which stands for freedom of information law. And they sent them out all 62 counties. And I think it took maybe a couple months before we got it. And, and can I just pause here for a minute, minute because this is, uh, I gotta say, this was surprising to me that there, there's a database that you can access as part of a FOIA, FOIA law in, in New York. I always kind of thought all this stuff was, was private, but then when you think about it, there would be a public interest in it. So real briefly, what is the law? What is the database? What can you get out of the database as being a citizen of New York? Okay. First off, it, it, it's for the whole country. This is federal law. Okay. But all of these things are, um, are public and the states limit the, the kind of information you can get. So some states limit it more than others in New York, you, we get quite a lot. Okay. The only thing that we're prevented from seeing as a, as a private citizen is the driver's license numbers and social security numbers. So we don't get that, but we get everything else. And the purpose of, of having this access is that we are supposed to be able to independently, um, confirm the accuracy and the currency of the database, meaning it is current, right? Um, so. And, and it has to be susceptible to challenges. And the only way to do that is to make it available to the public. So what we are working with entirely are publicly available records given to us directly by the people who compile and uh, manage those records. Okay. So that's it. We don't have anything else. Um, you know, there are a couple of, uh, different places we've gotten the records from, you know, the, the voter rolls came from the individual counties in the state. But uh, other information, like for instance, uh, we have the uh, published certified results from the Secretary of State, but anyone can get those. They're on the Secretary of State's website, so no big deal there. Um, I did get one file and I wish I knew the provenance of it and I don't, so I, I can't really say it's official, but it's a count of votes from all the precincts. And um, the only reason I trust it is because every spot check I've done, it matches exactly with other sources that I have. So. Um, I'm thinking it's an accurate count. However, I can't, uh, I can't claim for sure that it's from an official source because I don't know where it came from. So you actually had to compile all the databases from all the different counties then. And you have a little bit of a database background because you're not only like a computer graphics genius, but you did this eight thousand database of precognitive dreams that is truly a, a just substantial breakthrough for parapsychology and precognition, and that's all in your book, Dreamer, 
which we talked about before, but I mean, that's just like an epic, epic kind of book, but you have this, this background. So when you call me and you say, you have the database, what did you have at that point? When I called you, uh, I got a little bit further. First, I have to make one, um, I have to give you a caveat. 22 counties gave us their databases. The remaining 40 did not. Okay. The state gave us their database, which gave us everything for all the counties. But the problem is the state database does not agree with county databases. Now you could say that's because there's a bit of a time lag between when we got them, but that really doesn't explain everything that we saw. Because for instance, I was looking at the, um, the county database and I was seeing certain numbers and I was talking to a colleague who was working with me on this project, who was working with the state database and we were comparing numbers. And every time we did it, it's like he had a different number than me. And I was feeling like, well, I'm, I'm the dumb one here, so I must be making a mistake. So I looked at it more carefully and I was like, no, I, I don't think I am. So I contacted him and I said, what's going on here? And he looked at it on his end. And it turned out our databases had different information for the same people. Okay. And um, like, for instance, there were, how many were there? In, in New York City alone, it was something like a quarter million votes were recorded in the county version of the records that were missing from the state version of the records, right? So for instance, so let's just say you had a vote recorded and you lived in Manhattan, okay? So you'd have an ID number and let's say your ID number is one, two, three, four, five, right? So if you look up ID number one, two, three, four, five in the state database, it would say Alex Securus, no vote, but well, actually it wouldn't say anything. It just wouldn't have uh, a record of a vote, right? But then if you look at the county record for the exact same file with your name and everything, it's gonna say 2020 general election. So the vote disappeared. And the thing is, the official record, according to the law, is the state record. So the state record, there's no vote, and the county record, there is. So what happened to it? And there's a quarter million of these. Actually, it's more than a quarter million. Each of the five boroughs, the average is 50,000. Small minutes. stuff. Small stuff, Andy. Don't bury the lead here. Get on to it, because... There's this, there's this moment here that is like an amazing one person can make a difference moment where you compile all this data into one database and then you start doing some, I don't know, some Jedi mind tricks kind of precognitive stuff, but you figure out this amazing pattern that shows this massive, massive, you can't really even say it's fraud. It's just the engineering of the potential of fraud in this thing. And, and let's get as quickly as we can to that part of the story, because that then leads to all the other parts of the story. I'll, I'll get there. So, so the thing is, so I'm seeing all this funny stuff going on, which makes it crystal clear to me, there are fraudulent records in the system, period. Okay. I know that it, it, it goes beyond that. Cause I was talking about how the, the records were falsified, where the, the votes were being taken away. But I also found um, somewhere in the neighborhood of just under a million records, which I now know is actually more than 2 million records, where they had fake registration. And I was thinking, okay, I've read about these fake registrations in other states. And, uh, and now I'm seeing them in New York. And they were in much larger quantities, by the way, than I saw in other states, except for maybe Pennsylvania. And I was thinking, these records are useless to anybody unless there's a way to find them. You have to be able to, and they have to do it covertly. The reason is because if you're, if you're casting a fake ballot, right? So first we have to talk about what a fake registration is and how you spot and how anyone could spot if they, if you pointed them to the data in the spreadsheet, like you have to me and you've shown the screen and you go, look, this is fake. We got 10 names, all the same name, different counties and different codes and stuff like that. But you, you, you can convince anyone pretty quickly that these are fake registrations. And that the next thing you're saying is what went through your mind is that to really turn that into a, a usable system for kind of being able to manage elections, manage being the operative word, you'd need some kind of more systematic way, to get your hands around this data as a, as a database guy, you're like, there, there has to be more than just people injecting fake data into the database. Okay, so we have 
the certain data fields that we can match so we can see if they agree with each other or not. Okay. So you've got your first name, your last name, your date of birth, you've got your address. So if I've got two records and all of that data is the same, then I take a look at the ID numbers and you've got two of them in New York. You've got a county ID and a state ID. If the state IDs are the same, that's a duplicate record and those are legal. And the reason is because you're allowed to move from one county to another county. So you get different county IDs and that means you get different ballots. But if your state ID numbers are different. That's a cloned record in order to create this fake ID. At least that's the way I'm characterizing it because that's how it looks. But the fact is that by law, you're not allowed to have more than one SBUID number. You're certainly not allowed to have 11 or 22 and you do have people who have that. Many. So that's a real problem. So those are clones. And if I were to show the list, it's just an endless stream of records. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. If I include records that they go before the 2020 election, it's actually 2.4 million of them. So if I can, let me bring it back to kind of on a personal level. If I was there and I started looking through that database and I found that cloned records that are clearly illegal, I wouldn't be totally stunned because I know there's election fraud has been going on since they started doing elections. You know, Joseph Stalin, it doesn't matter who votes. It matters who counts the vote. This is as old as time. So I wouldn't be really that shocked if I was you, if I was in your situation and I found these cloned registrations, these other irregularities. But what really caught me when you started talking to me was the scale of this and then the programmed nature of it. So keep going. I know you're getting there, but I want to push you to get there as soon as you can. I'm sorry. Okay. So anyway, so I compare these names and I'm like, okay, well, these all have his ad. So this is definitely the right guy. It's the same guy, but I look at the ID numbers and they're not the same. Okay. So this is an issue. Uh, now the, the, we have county IDs and state IDs. The county IDs can be different. Okay. This is if you move from one county to another, but the state IDs cannot be different. You can move out of the country and come back and you still have to have the same state ID. The law actually has all sorts of things built into the system so that you cannot get a new SBUID. The first thing any registrar is supposed to do when they look at your application is, does this person already exist in the database? That it, it's the first question, question they have to ask. They're not asking you, they're asking the database based on the information you give them. So they're doing exactly the same search I'm doing, which also means they know you're a clone, okay? Because I know you're a clone. They have to, because they've got the same data. I know that because I've got their data. That's what they gave. Okay. So the thing is, here I am 10 o'clock in the morning, popping out of the shower one day, and I'm thinking about this and it occurs to me, you know what? We have, at that time, I didn't know how many it was, but it was hundreds of thousands. We have hundreds of thousands of fake registrations in the database. And they're hard to find because there's 21 million records in the database. They're basically, it's like dropping water into the ocean. How are you going to find those specific drops? The bad guys who do this cannot use them unless they can access them, which means they have to know which ones are fake and which ones are real. And so I was thinking about that and it's, I, I was thinking there has to be a way that they have tagged these files so that they know which is which. Now, it seemed to me, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense to have a field called, you know, fake registration. And then they just tick the box if that's what it is, because it'd be too obvious. If they did that, they'd have something inside the database that would clue everybody into the fact that they're breaking the law. So they had to do it in a way that nobody would notice. So I was asking myself, okay, so, so where could they do that? I mean, could they, could they have like a special key code that they would add to a, a field? So I was looking at all the fields. I was trying to figure out which field would they be most likely to manipulate? And I was trying to figure out if there are any differences in these fields. Um, and I wasn't really getting very far with that. Um, but it still was bugging me. So for months, I was trying to keep an eye out for any sign that something like that was going on, that these records were tagged in any way. And I eventually discovered a way that, that these records were tagged, but it was not the way I expected because I was expecting them to modify something that was there. I didn't expect them to link two things in a unique way was effectively a tag. So, so the data actually stayed the same, but by linking things that shouldn't be linked, it made it possible to identify these. And that's where the start of discovering this algorithm, uh, came from. Okay. So, so we might, we might need to be a little bit geeky for a minute 
and explain that because the two fields that you linked together were in this unusual way were the state ID and the county ID, right? And yeah. we should show people it, it, well, maybe you can explain it so we don't have to show too many things and get in trouble potentially with showing stuff that, but maybe you can, maybe you can't, whatever you figure that out. I anonymized the, the whole thing. So I can show it without any names or anything. And I, uh, so it, it is anonymized. Okay. So you, you have this relatively long state ID. It, 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 you can't really mess with that directly. Otherwise somebody's going to find out. And you have this county ID and you can't mess with that directly. So. What show us jump to this kind of very, very cool thing where you link these two together. It's a fantastic story. It's a, it's like one of the, one of the little anecdotes I love about this. Andy does this and it's unbelievable. Imagine a guy sitting in his office in New York who just wasn't even thinking of doing this and then kind of cracks the code on the largest election, electronic election fraud scam in United States history that's known. He cracks the code and now they're going to go start telling it. I'm moving it forward in the story you'll pick up, but he goes in and has like some super high level, I don't know, FBI or, you know, child, whatever, looking over his shoulder and they're like, dude, would you take a job as being a forensic database? Cause they can't believe what you've done which we're going to show us in a minute in terms of how you crack this code. But that's the kind of feedback that you get at the end of this in terms of the level of what you figured out here. I'm not stretching that, right? That's true. Uh, yeah, except not the FBI. Uh, yes, I should. Of course it wasn't the FBI, but right. Yeah. It is at, at a level of, you know, significant law enforcement. Apparently agents. there were people who thought I had some skills when it came to this kind of stuff. So show them, show them the database. So let's go to the Yates spiral. Okay. So let's just open this. Up. Okay. Now I have cleaned this up. Okay. So what, what you're seeing right now, you absolutely would not be able to see if you were just looking at the database. Okay. It would be impossible because the actual database is an absolute jumble. What I had to do is I had to filter this. I had to filter it in a very specific way, in a way that nobody who worked at the county or the state would ever do unless they knew the algorithm was there. There are a lot of steps to get to what I'm showing you now, show you basically the clean version of the algorithm. So what they've done is they've taken what I'm calling a short ID, that's the state ID and the county ID, which is this, and they've linked them. Okay. So if you look at these, I've highlighted them so that you can see the, the algorithm that they're working with. So this is blue. See, this is a one digit number for the county ID. These are all five digit numbers. And then they're broken by a four digit. Now, if you look at this four digit number and you go to the next one, you see they're, they're consecutive 15, three, five, four, and then 15, three, five, five, and then 15, three, five, six. So these are all separate, uh, by a, an even distance. So these are 11 apart. Now. Uh, just going based on the number of rows apart isn't the best way because sometimes they're missing records. It's better to actually uh, subtract these numbers from each other and then you get exactly 11 different. But as you can see, this is pretty consistent, okay? But the thing is, it's much more complicated than you might think just by looking at the first few records. So can I just interject something? Because they're not supposed to be consistent. <laughs> A standard story of how these numbers would be generated. Like if you go to register to vote, you're given a number, it, you, you wouldn't wind up with this pattern. No, no, not even close. Explain why that shouldn't be there on a really basic level. Okay. Well, we sent, uh, email requests to all 62 county commissioners asking them, how do you assign your numbers? Okay. And the county commissioners all said, we assigned the numbers, uh, consecutively. Okay. And to an extent that's true, but it's not really true. It's just sort of true. So if you look at the, the numbers that start, they have five digits here, like 15, three, five, four, and look at the date, that's October 14th, 1978. And the next one in that sequence is also October 14th, 1978. And the same thing goes for the next one. The problem is the way they're broken up like this. So all of a sudden you're going from dates in 1997 to 78, to 97, to 78 and so on. So they've broken the pattern. So they've taken something that was sequential and then they've blown it to smithereens so that they can have this, this pattern. Okay. Um, but the thing is it gets much more complicated. So see here, this pink one, 
This is showing up in the ninth position. So the positions that are important here are the, uh, the first position, which is here, the fourth position here, the ninth, and then the 11th. And also there's an optional 12th that happens every 10 records. So what this is going to do is it's going to start counting by 100. So these guys are counting by, uh, oh, by the way, I hate to say this because this is a complicated pattern, but when you're sorting by SPOID, which is what I did here, the, uh, the gaps are 11, 111, 1,000, 111, 11,111, 111,111, 111,111. If you're sorting by CID, the gaps are 10, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million. So, um, so I, I, I get mixed up between those two sometimes. I almost said 10, but I should say 11 because of the sort method here. But the thing is that here we're on row 83, which by the way is all by itself significant. I'll explain why in a second. And this is the first pink one. So if I go down, if I add 111 to that, that's 194. So if I go to row 194, there's the next pink one. That's 111 down. This is predictable. What you're showing us, the big picture takeaway is you are now looking at a database. One, there's no one in the world would have figured out this key to showing this, these regularities or irregularities, however you want to look at it, these patterns that you found in the data that suggest an algorithm is behind this. Because again, back to your big picture, you just said a minute ago, like if you task somebody with the job of saying, okay, we got this database over here. What I need to be able to do, because I like to rig elections, I need to be able to quickly pull up all of our fake registrations in a particular county, and then I need to manipulate them, and then I need to change them back, and I need to make it so that no one ever saw how to do it. And what you're telling me is that when you first look at the database, you go, well, that's impossible. There's no key that someone could pull up all the clones. And Andy goes, well, wait, actually there is. And you could actually write computer code that would then pull this up. And then they have all these other tricks like giving codes that are out of range and in range and top of range and bottom range. And you could go into that and you could talk to us for hours about what you found. I just don't want people to miss the big picture of what you're looking at is the system by which you would manage, again, operative word, manage a database like this in order to commit election fraud. Yeah, and that is true. It, I, it, it can be used to do that. Now, I need more information to be able to say they definitely used it that way, but it could be used that way. Whoa, whoa, don't back down here. Because so the, the next thing I talk about purged. Yeah, okay. The purged records are very interesting. We, we know that they're not really treating purged as purged. Purged means they're ineligible to vote. And we have over 30,000 people who voted after they were purged. So clearly purged means standby or something else. Again, hold up. Cause you just said the world there. You have 30,000 people that were purged and voted. And now I want you to swing back and connect it to something you said earlier about this is what the citizenry are supposed to be able to do is to be able to check these elections, if you will. That's why they're made publicly available. And I want you to tell me this, tell the story to everyone that you told me the other day that you actually have boots on the ground, that you found a purge record and tell me oh, the story yeah. without revealing a name of somebody who did it. Because I hate when we get to this point and we go, well, it's a potentially that this could be used. Oh, come on. Let's just get on with it. This was used to manipulate, you know, why can we accuse everyone else of, of doing this or Russians and everybody else? Why do we know that we've done this for ages in every country around the world? It's been the standard spy craft to be able to go into a country and if the elections close, use some kind of technology like this to manipulate it in our favor, which by the way, we'll have you tell that story in a minute, but I want you to tell the story of the door check, knock check that you did on the purge. Oh, okay. So after doing a lot of research and identifying suspicious records, I made requests of what we call the cannabis team. And those guys went out and they knocked on doors and they checked on things. So the first group that they checked on were the cloned records. And we found, you know, confirmation that indeed they were cloned records. The voters themselves had no idea what was going on. They didn't know they had extra IDs. They were totally unaware of it. And some of them were actually pretty extreme. I mean, we had 
examples where the, the documents we got back from the, from the county showed forged signatures on the registration documents. And the, when we showed it to the voter, they were really surprised. And they were like, in one case, this lady told our canvasser, you know, this has my three registrations all on the same two days, one right after the other, a year before I actually registered to vote. And I know this because I was pregnant when I went in there to register and my one-year-old son is in the house right now. And this is the year 2022. I didn't register to vote in 2020. I registered a year after that. But all three of those registrations were, were predated basically by a year. And that made her eligible to vote in elections that she didn't vote in and wasn't eligible to vote in. And she, she confirmed that the signatures were photographic duplicates of her signature. They were pixel by pixel, exactly the same. Another example, we had a gal who had two votes recorded for her and, uh, both in 2020, she was a young gal in her twenties, early twenties, she had just she was just then able to vote for the first time in a presidential election. And she went down with her mother in 2020 to vote on November 3rd, right? So she went there and when she arrived at the, at the polling station, she was told, you know, you're not registered to vote. Therefore you can't vote, we can't let you vote. And so she was like, well, can I register? And they're like, no, you can't registration deadline has passed. So you can go online and you can register, but you're going to have to wait for the next election to vote. So, uh, what she told her canvasser was. Uh, a couple of weeks later, she did go online and she did register to vote. But meanwhile, what we had in our records was a vote for the 2020 election for each of her two cloned ID numbers. So she had two ID numbers, each of which had voted. And in the records, it showed that she had registered on November 23rd, which is 20 days after the election, which is almost a month after the deadline for registering. So, so in that case, we're, we're looking at someone who um, managed to vote before she was registered and who managed to vote even though she didn't vote and managed to do it twice, even though she didn't do it once. So when we go out and canvas, this is the kind of thing we find out. We find it happens over and over and over again. You know, we give the benefit of the doubt most of the time to, to, um, uh, how shall I say this records that could be legal. We give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. It's only the ones that. Not a, not a, not a, not I, I hate when we defaulted to all that kind of correctness, kind of bullshit. It's like, look, you just proved election fraud. Then the big question that everyone has is, does it scale? How could it scale? You know, are they hacking the machines? Whatever. That was the whole dialogue that has now disappeared. Like now we can talk about this stuff, right? A couple of years ago, you couldn't talk about it. Now you can't talk about it. It's in the past. So you connected the two. So you got people, boots on the ground, went out there and said, hey, is this you? Did you do this? Like, no. So then it's in the database. That's election fraud. No question. The real breakthrough that you do is you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Here's the scale of it, guys. Millions of records. Here's how it's done. Here's how you would sit back on your computer and pull it up and change it and do it. Here are the means. Here are the keys. Or doing it. That's, that's the breakthrough that you bring us. Yeah. And actually one thing I, I should also point out is individual voters are totally incapable of doing this. You can't, you have to have access to the official database to do it. So everything I'm seeing in the database, it's giving me the information that allows me to send people out to canvas and then get these answers is information that can only be entered by people who've got access to that database. And that's a really, really important point because like I've got a, there's an assembly woman in New York state who, according to the voter rolls, double voted in three separate elections, 2016, 18 and 19. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I seriously doubt she has any idea that her records show that. And that's just based on every other bit of canvassing that we've done. And all of you would be surprised that they've got all these extra, um, ID numbers. One lady, she had, she had a married name and a maiden name, and both of them had their own independent registration numbers, which all by itself is illegal. And what she discovered was her maiden name had continued voting, but her married name was erasing the votes that she was making. So she was making real votes that didn't show up in the record. And she was really mad about that. And then the other registration was voting well after she stopped using the name. And after that registration number, well, actually that registration number should be the one she's still using. Actually, uh, it's kind of a funny thing because by cloning, what they're doing is they're basically giving the fake record to the real voter. And they're keeping the real record, the one that's legal, that is to say, and they're using it for their own purposes, which is kind of an odd thing. Hey, Andy, I want you to tell the story of the guy on your team who has uh, an Intel black ops background without revealing his name, obviously. 
but I, I think it's very telling. It really shouldn't be surprising. We've heard this all along, but it's really, really significant when you, when you hear that something like that directly from somebody on the team. Okay. Well, first off, he's not on the team. He was helping the team. So he's, he's like more of a consultant. Um, but this particular guy, when I showed him the algorithm, he was really shocked because he'd seen it before. He said, I used to do elections overseas for the military, and we used something that looked just like that to make sure that we could manage those elections. He said, I never expected to see it in the United States. And he's one of two guys with the same background that told me the same thing. So they say there's a couple of differences. Like he said, in Iraq, they have serial numbers on the ballots, which we don't have. But, but as far as like the, the, uh, the numerical difference between the records are what's called rep units. So that's uh, two digit or greater numbers that are all made out of one. So 111, 111, et cetera. He said that kind of a thing is just all over the place in that software that they were using. So yeah, it's, and he actually said this on TV a little while ago. He'd been, in a response to one of the other people on our team, he was like, you know, uh, uh, military contractors who work elections, you guys know this, you've seen it. That's amazing. I think that leads into some of the bigger questions because, you know, one of the interesting things about you, Andy, because we have been friends for a long time and we've kind of been through a lot of different things, you know, just kind of in our private conversations, but y you were kind of a Trumpster there for a while. You've written for Red Voice, Red Voice Media, and you still do. And that's fine, but I definitely get the sense, and I think it's partially because of this research, that you don't see, you see yourself more apolitical, if you will, kind of more along, along lines that I do, that this is a, a sham at a much bigger level. And you've shared with me that your research tells you that this cannot be uh, pinned to one party, one political group or another. It's more or less a, a technology that can be applied to whoever they decide to apply it to. Do you want to speak to that? Well, I do agree with you. I, I still have my, my favorites and they tend to be on one side of the political spectrum as, as opposed to the other. But I also have a lot of people on both sides that I really think are absolute criminals, frankly. And when I, and the fact is that this system, what we're seeing, it doesn't seem to play favorites the way people would expect. And actually one of the, one of the problems we've had is that sometimes Republican politicians are made aware of this and they're like, well, that could be used against us too. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it absolutely could. And it could also be used in their favor. And the other thing it implies is that anybody who's currently in office benefited from this, whether they realized it or not. So I, I think that there's probably, you know, pockets of honest elections that you have throughout the country. And there's probably places where fraud was implemented in order to make sure a certain candidate won, but it was unnecessary because that person was going to win anyway. So that you, you do get the people's choice sometimes, but with this algorithm that they're using and the other kinds of fraud that we're seeing imply is that our votes actually don't play a significant role in who wins. They, they do play a more significant role if the margin of victory is more than about 10%. But if it's less than 10%, it seems to be completely stage managed. Uh, that's how it looks to me. And as far as who they're, they're picking, it seems like, and I'm, this is kind of going off my own research here when I say this, but, but it looks to me like if you've got a very Republican area, that they're going to pick a Republican to win, but it's going to be a Republican that, um, that they like. And if it's a heavily Democrat area, then. You know, you've got Democrats who behave more like Republicans in, in the, at least the way they're portrayed in the popular media, but they'll find a Democrat who is exactly what they want. And then they'll let that guy win or that gal, whoever it is. Um, so the whole thing seems to be a, a battle of perceptions. It's like, okay, what will the people accept who we will also accept, you know, whoever it is that's managing this stuff. And when I say whoever it is that's managing this stuff, I really don't know who it is. Um, it's, I would not pin it on a political party. Absolutely not. As far as I'm concerned, whatever is controlling this is controlling both political parties and probably a little bit more beyond that, which is actually kind of a spooky thing to think about. Well, it, it, it's spooky, but maybe in a way it gets us back to what the show's all about, <laughs> you know, skeptico, inquiry to perpetuate doubt, but also, also why evil matters. What is evil about this? What is evil about the deception? And don't we have to live with a little bit of this just as part of the way the, the sausage gets made, as they say, you know, it's like, hey man, when you're 
overthrowing the election in some country that's teetering on going commie, then, you know, maybe you stand back and go, oh, God, thank God we got in there and we did a better job of throwing the elections than the Russians did or the Chinese did or whatever. And there's a certain part of that narrative that we accept and go, well, I guess that is kind of part of the price we pay for the good part of the American empire. But then that quickly comes around to kind of bite us in the butt when we look at how it can be weaponized against us. Totally agree with you. And I've been, I have a feeling that there's some element of that that we disagree on, but for the most part, I think it is a terrible thing that we created methods that are so dangerous. We use them against other people and then figured it would never happen to us because we're the ones with the tools. You know, they, they have this, this well-known saying in Christianity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Well, we are doing unto them apparently what is being done to us. Okay. And that I think is exactly what we should expect after having created something like this. And it's a shame. And I, frankly, I think that these kind of tools need to be eradicated. And even if other people try to use them against us, we can't use them, period. It's just too dangerous. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got people who are all up in arms about gun control. This stuff with elections is far more dangerous because with this, you can control nuclear missiles and you can control a lot of other things. Like for instance, fake vaccines uh, connected to fake pandemic that you can kill a lot of people without their even knowing that they're being murdered essentially. I, and I hate to say it so strongly, but that's how I view the, the vaccine right now. Um, but in any event, um, yeah, this is, this is a very dangerous thing. And I think that we let ourselves in for it when we said, you know what, it's okay to treat other countries like this. It's just not, uh, we are not being good neighbors by doing this. We are not being good shepherds at all. We can't think of an honest way to handle our foreign relations that we need to think harder. We don't need to just become every bit as criminal as the other guy. I don't, I just don't think that works. I don't know. I, I get you. I, I love the idealism. I think that gets us to really a spiritual perspective to me is the only way you can resolve that. Because if you're talking about this world, then you're always going to be making compromises because it is about getting that hill and you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall kind of stuff. And there's a reality to that, that I think we too often want to kind of forget. You live a great phony baloney lifestyle there in New York. And I certainly lead a great phony baloney lifestyle here in Southern California. And if that was ever really threatened, I'm not so sure where I draw the line of righteousness, particularly when those enemies could be some other systems that really, really don't care on a deep level. So, you know, maybe, maybe trace that water one more time with response to that. Cause I, I love your Christian idealism. I'm not sure it works in the real world, but then again, I, I appreciate what you're doing because I think what you're doing is the essence of being an American. It is the only chance we have to fight to the end for those ideals, for that, for that perfection, for that beacon of light on the hill. And, uh, that's what I see that you're doing even if it seems like kind of a pushing the boulder up the mountain only for it to roll off the other side kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I certainly see where you're coming from. I mean, it reminds me of Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place, which is about how two sisters were hiding Jewish people in Holland. They both got brought to the uh, concentration camps and the sister refused to compromise her, her Christian principles. And she wound up dying there and the other one made compromises and she lived and wrote the book. And so what you're basically saying is in exigent circumstances, how are you going to behave? And frankly, I don't know until I meet the, or encounter those, those circumstances, but I do feel rather strongly that if we say it's okay to engage in what we consider to be abhorrent behavior, just so we can deal with other people who are engaging in abhorrent behavior, we're not thinking harder enough. There's probably another way to get there. Okay. The, the story I always use for the longest time, a Ram Dass story, we're both yogi kind of people. So Ram Dass is there with Neem Kroli Baba and he says, okay, uh, so, so forgive me. These are Ram Dass stories. So you don't know what part is kind of mythical, <laughs> what part is real, but he's sent to this distant village along with this other devotee volunteer to bring this medicine 
to these peasants, right? And they get to the hill and there's a guy there and he goes, yeah, you got to pay me in order to get there. He's an armed guy. He's, you know, mafia, he's a cartel, whatever you want to say it in terrorist, however you want to put it in today's words. And he says, no, pay me. And Ram Dass goes, we can't, we, we can't do that. That would violate everything that Baba is all about. You know, if the, we'd be compromising our, our, ourselves and compromising the whole act of what we're trying to do of love and kindness and bringing this medicine to these people. And the woman is just outraged. She's like, what are you talking about? See those kids down there? You can see them running around. Some of them will be blind. Some of them will be dead if we don't bring that medicine. So give the guy a few rupees. Let's get the medicine down there. So I always think, you know, what's the right action in that situation? And I don't think there, I don't think there is one. What do you think? Well, in that particular case, I think the, the most expedient answer is to give the guy the money and go down and save the villagers, uh, assuming they're not giving them COVID vaccine because then they have the opposite result. But, um, but hold on, everybody, everybody says that. So I've developed a twist that I, I like to add to the story now. Great, because everybody says that. Okay, now here's what your money is doing. This guy is involved in sex trafficking. And what he's going to do is go find some opium addicted peasant and going to buy his 11 year old daughter and sell that daughter into a life of prostitution and sex slavery. So now same question. What's your answer? That yeah, probably be the same answer. Maybe come back and, and, uh, arrest the guy or, or deal with him somehow, but, uh, to prevent that from happening. But if you have one thing that has a like a, like a timeline on it where we're getting it accomplished quickly. Uh, how shall I say this? If you don't get it done quickly, then you lose the opportunity. I, I would say do that first and then deal with the second problem. And the second problem is stopping this other stuff that's going on. But the, as getting all the way back to the election business that we're seeing here, uh, we clearly develop very dangerous tools that are being used against us. Okay. That's assuming that the military intelligence guy who said that to me is correct. I assume he is correct, but no matter who did it, the tools are super dangerous and these things can cause much more harm than they're being credited for being capable of doing. You know, when I see the way that election fraud is handled by politicians and the judiciary, and in some cases, investigative authorities, I'm really disappointed that they seem to think elections are so unimportant that they don't have to investigate them. They don't have to prosecute cases like this and they don't have to deal with them in any meaningful way. They, so they're able to go out there with the talking points that all of our elections are safe and secure. Um, to me, that is absolutely terrifying that these guys don't realize that, hey, or the people of this country don't realize that when they take an election from you, they are taking an immense amount of power over you, okay? It's the same people who are allowing riots to take place without punishing anyone. They have cities burned down, buildings looted, people shot, people injured. They're, they're allowing these vaccine shots to go out all over the place and people getting hurt and they're not stopping it, despite the fact that all the rules that were in place up until 2021, early 2021, would have prevented that from happening. That, they would have stopped the vaccines for the first couple of deaths. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have allowed them to stay going for all this time. It's ridiculous. There's an amazing amount of damage that's being, um, that we're seeing as a result of stolen elections, because this just could not have happened without the stolen elections. It's just ridiculous. What do you say we watch a Dr. Zark video? <laughs> Go for it. This is Dr. Zark of New York Citizens Audit. Welcome to lesson six in our ongoing election fraud series, Attack of Clones. Cloned records in New York are a problem. New York Citizens Audit has found no less than 320,000 excess numbers. This is what they look like. This is only the start of the shortest list we it would take take speed to show them. Is this a problem? There you go. All right, Dr. Zark, what did we just see? <laughs> You saw one of 15 videos that I made to explain in one minute segments, although some of them go a little over that, um, some of the findings that we've come up with at New York Citizens Audit. So that particular one was a way to demonstrate that 
the sheer quantity of clones that we found. And that particular list that I was uh, zipping through, and I didn't get through the whole thing because it just takes too long, uh, was about 100,000 records long. Uh, I have another list at 630,000 records, and I never bothered exporting the list. It's 2.4 million records. Um, but the, the fact is there's a lot of records and it's, it's just really, really shocking how many there are that are compromised. You know, imagine this, we're in New York state, there's 21 million records in the voter rolls and how many people voted? 8 million. Okay. And how many people actually live here? Nowhere close to 21 million. We've got a lot of excess records. And, you know, one thing I'll mention about this is that uh, Judicial Watch, which is an organization that, uh, well, they basically file FOIA requests and sue uh, um, various government uh, officials and entities for reasons based on, uh, related to election fraud. Um, they recently sued New York City uh, because they said, you have all these excess uh, records in your roles. And of course it's true, they do. Uh, and New York, in fact, is the, one of the most egregious offenders in uh, New York State. And by the way, when I say New York City, uh, people might not be aware New York City is made of five counties. So there are uh, Bronx, uh, Kings, Queens, Richmond, and New York County. So New York County is Manhattan. That's the island, but the other five are around or four are around them. So he sued all four or five of those counties and got them to agree to remove the out-of-date records, right? So, um, so what they did was they sent him a note, which he trumpeted all over his website, you know, saying, we, we agree, we are going to remove 430, I think it was 431,000 and change records, uh, of the, these out of date records. Right. And they, they said, we did this on February 2nd, uh, I think it was 2022. And so what I did was I, I had one of our guys take a look at the databases on either side of that date, because we had a database from October of 2021 and another one from May of 2022. And I said, just find out if they really took out those records. And guess what? They did. Okay. They lied to the court. Okay. And not only that, it's kind of interesting because if you look at it, you have, you have the number of records is actually going up every database we have. So every few months, the number of records is going up pretty significantly. And at the same time, we have a declining population. So we have more people leaving than we have coming in. And somehow the number of records is going up at a constant pace. Um, and meanwhile, they supposedly took out almost half a million records. Now, what we did find was about 300,000 records that were converted from active status to purged status. But that's not 438,000. And that's not necessarily deleting them either. So, so somewhere along the line, something got missed. And Never mind the fact that some of them got changed from active purge. I looked up some special cases, you know, people who have 11 records and 22 records, they're still there. They're very, oh, Andy, and oh, Andy, Andy, Andy. What? Like I always say, twas always thus. What are you going to do about this? Obviously nothing is going to happen, but again, you're fighting the good fight the honorable fight, the righteous fight. Where do you plan on going with this? Well, fact is, I didn't want to do this in the first place. And while I'm working on it, I don't want to do it. I can't wait till this is all over and I can go back to doing commercial photography because I like visual arts and I want to get back to that. However, I can't seem to drag myself away from it because it's kind of fascinating. And also there doesn't seem to be anything else to do right now, thanks to the world being all in chaos at the moment, as you might've noticed. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a sub stacks, I'm writing about this, but like all the rest of my writing is because somebody else asked me to do it. Um, uh, yeah, you know, you mentioned my writing for law enforcement today and red voice. Um, I never really planned on writing, um, for other people, but they keep on asking me. So I keep on doing it, but, um, yeah, I can't wait till this is over. I, and as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the data has to be analyzed. We have to get it into the right hands and then those people have to do their job. And then if it's at all possible, this has to get fixed. But as far as I'm concerned, the second I can stop doing this, I'm out of here. Um, but at the moment it remains interesting. I mean, it, it's just the other day I found something really fascinating. I discovered that these guys were actually changing people's state ID numbers so that they could take, uh, a criminal, a illegally generated record and make it look like it was legal. And, you know, the, the thing is, I was, I was thinking, you know, what they could give as an explanation for that. We, we've got tens of thousands of these, by the way, uh, is they could say, well, we noticed 
that this looked illegal. So we fixed it by making it look legal. And, you know, the funny thing is that's kind of what cooking the books is all about, right? That's, that's, oh, we noticed if somebody else saw this, they noticed that we're stealing money. So we had to fix the book so that it didn't look like we we're stealing money. It's like, that might be their explanation. There's not a particularly good explanation. And it certainly doesn't absolve them of any guilt. Um, but you know, we found that too, when we were uh, asking for the registration records is that, um, they purged them when they got the request. So they were active for years. And then when they got our request, they looked at all these cloned records and was like, oh my gosh, this is the same person. We better purge all those guys right now. So it doesn't really fix the problem. You know what I'm saying? You know, sometimes you can fix a broken window and it's all done and nobody cares anymore. But when you're talking about a crime, which is what we're talking about here, fixing it actually covers up the crime. And so that's not really fixing it. Now you're looking at obstruction of justice, uh, justice, uh, official malfeasance, um, negligence. Uh, I think there's another word in there. Oh, destruction of evidence. Yeah. So it's four things, destruction of evidence. Um, and there's obstruction of justice and then it's official malfeasance plus negligence. So, um, so that doesn't really fly. And that's one thing that I kind of dislike about what I've been seeing in the, in the press about this is sometimes people will complain. They're like, okay, this happened needs to be fixed. And then they say, okay, we fixed it. Everything's fine now. And I'm like, no, because the problem that was created was the result of a crime. You didn't investigate the crime. You didn't go find the person who did it and say, you need to go to jail or pay a fine or something. Um, and that step has to be taken. You know, one thing that really disturbs me about this, and I do want to say this is, um, these cloned records make it look like innocent people have committed voter fraud. Okay. I don't believe for a second that these are genuine examples of voter fraud. Um, they are election fraud. Election fraud is handled at a much higher level. It cannot be done by individual voters. So I know of a case right now that happened in New York, um, where a immigrant to this country who has a green card, um, has something like, I think I forget what the number was. It was like eight or nine registration records. Okay. And all was different SBID numbers. And I checked in the database and I, I found that it was true. And some of them had voted, right? And, uh, but the guy wasn't an American citizen. He's not eligible to vote at all, let alone both times in the same election, right? So his records make it look like that's what he did. But this guy says, in answer, he says, I didn't even know I was registered. I never registered to vote in the first place. And I certainly have never voted. And the fact is, I actually believe the guy, okay? And I believe him because of what I'm seeing in the voter rules. Um, but he was actually being investigated by the DA's office for voter fraud. That can actually happen to people whose names are being used like this. And it really, really bugs me because what happens is they're transferring the blame for something that happened that could only happen at a high level down to people at the very bottom level who are not only innocent, they have no idea that the thing that even happened. They don't even know that their names are being used like this. Um, so, you know, that's one thing I, I definitely want to deal with because I, I don't like the idea of innocent people um, even being annoyed by someone knocking on their door and, and pestering them to see if they committed voter fraud or not. I mean, they are utterly innocent of any knowledge of this. Um, they shouldn't be bothered at all. Um, so it, it, it really bugs me that we've got all these people at a very high level doing something to achieve their own nefarious end, whatever that happens to be. And in so doing, they are throwing the blame for everything they do. If it's ever discovered on the bottommost month rung of the hierarchy here. And in that, this case, that means the victims are then getting blamed for the people, uh, who are victimizing them. It's, it's horrible. It's like incredibly perverse to see this. I hate this. So anyway, there you go. But you wanted to talk, I wanted to say something about the out of range records and I wanted to show you a couple images because they're pretty shocking. You don't want to no, show no, 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 I think we, can I, I think say you, something? I, I want to say you, something. No, no. Oh, come on, Alex. Let me see. You can, you can it say it, but I'm going to I'll cut it out. All right. We'll see. Okay. One thing about the algorithms, you got the out of range numbers and the in range numbers. If you're going to say it, then you better say what you mean when you say out of range, in range numbers, because you're going to have to roll this all the way back to somebody walks in, they want to register to vote, they're assigned a number, it's supposed to be a random, uh, it's supposed to be a sequential number, whatever the next one on the list is, and then why you would even need, you would have to say why you even need a range, how that would even work, which is kind of, and then why there would be so many that aren't in a range. I mean, it's, it's another half hour if you really want to do it properly. Okay, so you're giving me an option here. You're not just explaining to me why I'm not going to do this. 
I mean, the thing is, is that they, these numbers uh, have some predictable characteristics that are kind of interesting. So if I share my screen, I'll show you what the ranges look like. And this is the key to the algorithm. Maybe if, if not for this, I would never have found it. Um, so when you look at a database, you, you're not looking at a, at what I'm seeing here. Okay. So what I've got is a bunch of uh, county names. I've got the county codes that are assigned by the state. I've got the, uh, the SBO ID numbers. That's the state ID numbers, uh, that are, that they have in those counties. And this is how many there are, et cetera. Okay. So you can't see this. Um, but more importantly, each of these counties are assigned a range of numbers. So Onondaga County here starts with this number that I've got my cursor over and it ends with this number. Okay. But that's only for about 56% of the numbers attached to Onondaga. All the rest are in a different area that is not reserved by county. So um, what happens is the numbers that are not in this territory disguise the presence of the numbers that are here. And they, they exist below and above um, these numbered ranges. So basically what they've done is they've thrown a whole bunch of chaff into the air. And then in a very narrow range in the middle, they've gone ahead and designated a certain range of numbers attached to each one of these counties. And again, you can't figure this out by looking at the database very easily. The way I did it was I had to actually look at every single number individually, look at the county it was attached to and figure out the relationships. And you, there was no way to sort it this way, because if you only look at the county, I'm going to get all that chaff. I'm going to get all that stuff that's out of range. And I'm also going to get all sorts of other numbers for people who moved into the county from another county and they're going to take their number with them. So it's a real mess. So it took me about a week to figure out these ranges. I didn't do it by myself. I had a, a colleague help me do it. Um, but once we figured it out, we realized they're utterly stable. The next thing was, let's look at the ranges. Now you saw what happened when I looked at the in-range numbers. That's that pattern made out of those rep units, the ones and 11s and 111s. And Andy, Andy, I promise you, no one is going to be able to follow this. No one is going to be able to get in your head. That's why you're one of the few people on the planet that could have ever decoded this. That's why you're Dr. Zark. So, I mean, go ahead if you want, but I just, I think you're way, way, way into it now in a way that I guess bolsters the point that you're making that, you know, they, it's pretty hard to figure this out from a, from a system standpoint, but go ahead. Well, okay. I was going to say, you could just cut it right there and I could have accepted that, but fine, I'll continue. So, um, in range, we have the spiral pattern, which is what I was showing you before with the, the 11th, right? But out of range, they have a different pattern. Now, the first time I looked at it, I was zooming in on it and I see, uh, these patterns. Okay. So these are numbers, uh, these are coordinates rather that are created by the CID numbers on the bottom and the state ID numbers on the left. Uh, and as you can tell, these are making shapes. This is not what you get when you sequentially assign numbers or consecutively assign numbers. This is a clear uh, graphic design element that's somehow been incorporated into these numbers. And the other thing that's kind of interesting, if you look at this group of numbers, this is 24,000 numbers, um, and almost all of them are purge status. Only one of them is active. So the thing that this implies is that um, purged records are going to be positioned like this. Okay. So I wanted to see how true was that? How far did that extend? And I found out it went very, very far indeed. So I'm going to show you a couple of other graphs. Andy, Andy. Right. Fine, fine. You know, you can stop it there and just, you know, reassure everybody it's complex and, and Andy can predict these things. And so that's fine. So I, I, I can predict things based on the, the numbers and I shouldn't be able to do that. It's just, it should be impossible, but unfortunately it's not. So I'll stop sharing this. There you go. How's that? You happy? I'm happy. It's, it's amazing. We'll leave people some links so that they can watch all the awesome Dr. Zark videos that you did, which are uh, drawn, hand drawn by you. A lot of them just uh, amazingly done. It's all hand drawn. <laughs> Again, how could we be having this conversation on Skeptico? when no one else has had this conversation. If someone steps back and really just takes a look at that aspect of it is like, this guy has done something truly amazing and he's tried to get people to pay attention. It's not like he's intentionally going dark on it. Just nobody cares. Well, 
I don't know if I'd go that far. It is actually getting quite a bit of traction in New York now. Um, although where, 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 Andy, where? Well, okay, look, I'm not going to give names, but we've got district attorneys now who are looking into it. And we've got some politicians who are looking into it. We've got people in other states that are looking into it. That is what you said a year ago. I mean, no, nothing will ever come of this by the nature of it. I mean, this is Epstein level kind of stuff. And the one thing we know about Epstein was it wasn't about Epstein, right? Actually, you, know what, you, just, you just said something that I'd like to have you comment on because you actually have some expertise with this kind of stuff. So when you saw all this data and you saw the, the algorithm that I pointed out to you, what were you thinking? Where, what, where did this come from, from your perspective? And what did it mean? Well, you know, when, when we first talked about this, I thought the real genius move on your part, because you're not really a computer programmer, and that was my educational background and my profession. So when I looked at it, my first thought was, how would I do it? How would I program it? You know, I'm not smart enough to program it, but I'm smart enough to know how somebody would program it. And I was stunned that you could reverse engineer it from just looking at the spreadsheet. I, I, I was, I was stunned. So all that stuff, you know, all that stuff that you said, you'd have to be able to write this algorithm. You'd have to be able to hide the algorithm in some code, either backdooring it in or some, you know, some election machine or something like that. All the stuff that is now revealed by the work that you've done. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, every person I talked to who had a background in computer engineering said pretty much the same thing. Uh, this is really complicated. They're really amazed it was discovered this way at, or discovered at all, actually. And as far as I know, actually, the only things like this that have been discovered in this country so far were discovered by me. Um, and that's this one, the one in New Jersey that I cracked. And, um, uh, although actually, no, wait, take it back. Hawaii looks like they've got a, a lead on this. So that one's kind of interesting. And they, the way they tag theirs based on what I've been told is more of an actual tag. So they, they've got 129,000 of their ID numbers, which is 10% of their population, which have the same 12 digits at the at appended to their UUID. They had a lazy systems engineer there in Hawaii. It was kind of too, he was just worried about getting out and catching some waves. He didn't want to do the hard work that they do in New York. It's that New York work ethic that they did it the right way. I wish it was a California work ethic. Frankly, I'd like to go hiking in Yosemite again one of these days, but it's too far away at the moment. Anyway, okay, so uh, is that all your questions or do you have a couple more? No, that's it. It was, uh, I'm so glad, I'm so glad we did it. Uh, we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. We'll leave people some links that they can go watch and check okay. out. If you don't mind, I'd appreciate it if you link to the Substack Sark files. At the moment, that's all the income I'm getting, and it's like nothing. <laughs> I've got 12 subscribers, eight subscribers. I've got 144 free subscribers. Okay, I'm going to cut it off there. I know that's kind of abrupt, but we just kind of rolled into this whole unbelievably great hour-long discussion about dreams, about why evil matters, precognition, all sorts of stuff related to his incredible precognitive dreams, which are really I'm changing to parapsychology as a whole. You know, again, the guy's a PhD, has published the dream book and published in peer reviewed journals about his precognitive dreams. So it's, it's an amazing conversation. And we went places that I've never gone with him before. So check that out. As far as this episode, the one question I tee up from this show is, is this a big deal? I'll tell you how much it's changed for me. When I first heard about this a year, year and a half ago, I thought it was a really big deal. Now, it don't seem like a big deal. How about for you? Let me hear from you. And join in the fun. I think I might go over to Discord. Don't know. Also, if you want to be a show producer and you have a guest that you think needs to be on the show, let me know and try and set it up. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.